Hello everybody, this is Marty Kessler with uh, BibleTalk.tv. This is the fourth lesson in a series of five lessons. The series is entitled, Things You Probably Did Not Learn in School. And this lesson is, The Rocks Cry Out. The title is taken from the 19th chapter of Luke where Jesus is entering Jerusalem and he was being told by some of the Jewish leaders to silence his disciples who were praising him as a great leader of the people. And he said, if I silence them, the rocks will cry out. And in this case, the rocks cry out. The rocks are testifying as to the deeds of God in the past. So that's where the title comes from. But what we're talking about is stratigraphy, strata. Strata is everywhere. And strata is defined by encyclopedia.com as the study of layered materials, strata, that were deposited over time. So we've got materials deposited over time, and what we'll find out is that those materials are deposited either by water or by lava or some, some liquid influence. But that's what we're looking at in this study, strata and what strata will tell us. So how were these layers of strata deposited? You see this very beautiful hillside, mountainside, uh, rock face, whatever you want to refer to that as, it's perfectly layered. All those lines of sediment just laid down in a, a wonderfully aesthetic, uh, eye-pleasing configuration. How in the world did that happen? That's what we're looking at today. And how long did it take? Did it take millions or billions of years, or did it happen much more rapidly than that? Those are questions we're looking at in this lesson. This is a picture of a hillside in Logan County, Logan County, West Virginia, West by the grace of God, Virginia. This is uh, near where I grew up. And this is what you have to do if you want to build anything in West Virginia. If you want to make a road, you got to cut off a hillside. You want to build a, a store, you got to cut off a hillside. And so this is what they have done. You'll notice vertical lines. Those are simply the uh, places where they've drilled down through the sedimentary rock to blast and cut away pieces of that rock so they can uh, open things up. But what I'm looking at and drawing your attention to right now are the horizontal layers, much like the ones we saw in the previous picture. This might not have the same coloration or beauty as the others, but you can still see those horizontal layers. And these layers are everywhere we look in the world. This is another area of West Virginia. It's called Boxy Syncline. Uh, I want you to notice about these layers that they are bent. These are layers of strata that evidently, before they hardened, were bent. So there was some kind of a seismic um, exercise going on that twisted or, or bent, turned these layers up or let the middle sink in. Somehow these layers of strata were bent. If this strata had hardened into stone before this had happened, then there would be break marks, the, there would be crumbles, but rather these layers are evenly bent, which indicates that they were still soft, still pliable when this seismic activity occurred. This is in Beaver's Bend Fold, Oklahoma. I didn't know beavers could do things like that, but it ev evidently there's some big beavers in the past somewhere. Uh, of course, all kidding aside, this is simply another place where the strata has been bent. And this is in Oklahoma, in the state where we are, in the United States of America, where we see the same type of stratigraphy. We've got strata that's been bent and it's not broken, so it must have been bent when it was still soft and pliable. So how did those layers get there? The standard explanation is that these layers were deposited slowly and gradually over long ages of time. That's what I was taught in school. That's what I have read decade after decade in all the uh, writings that address the strata. But uh, and there's an alternative explanation, and that explanation is that these layers were deposited rapidly over a single year during the flood of Noah's day. And you can read about that flood in the Bible book of Genesis, chapters 6 through 8. It tells us about that flood that God brought over the surface of the whole earth and covered everything to a, a depth of about 21 feet. So everything, according to Genesis chapters 6, 7, and 8, was buried underwater to a depth of at least 21 feet. And it lasted for a year. So you can imagine all of the 
activity that would have been taking place in that water if that happened. But the evidence looks like it did. Now here's my obligatory disclaimer claim, and that is that I am not a geologist. I am, however, fully qualified to tell you what geologists say. Everything in this lesson is being presented to you partly because qualified geologists say it's all so, but mostly because God said it was so. When the Bible tells us that there was a great flood that covered the whole earth, and we ought to be able to find evidence of that flood, and I believe the strata is one of our best evidences for the flood of Noah's day. As the Holy Scriptures have been misinterpreted through the ages, and of course they have, so the message of the stones has been misinterpreted. I would challenge you to find anything that the Bible teaches that in one way or another has not been twisted to say something other than what it was originally meant to say. Almost everything God has taught us in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant has been taken out of context or uh, twisted in, in some way to make it give a message that God did not intend. And it's the same thing that happens with the stones that have been left, the strata. Some folks interpret it one way, but we interpret it quite a different way. And you'll have to make up your mind what you will believe about these things. Strata is prolifically ubiquitous. I just like to sound smart, so I use these big, long, fancy words. All that means is it's everywhere. Strata's everywhere. You've seen it. You see it everywhere. Here's some down by the ocean that you find on every continent of the world. Here's some in a desert canyon that you'll find on every continent of the world, nearly. And here's some, of course, in mountains, as we have already seen and you see on a nearly daily basis, depending on where you are in the world. But it is everywhere. Sedimentary rock is made from, ta-da, sediment. But what's sediment? It's any material that settles to the bottom of a liquid. That's what sediment is. Any material that is deposited by water is considered sediment. I don't know how you make your coffee, but in times past, I remember my mom had a percolator and she would put coffee grounds in the top and the water would get hot in the bottom and come up and percolate down through the coffee grounds and make coffee. And it was a wonderful way to make very good coffee, but the problem was you had a little bit of coffee grounds in the bottom of your coffee cup, and all that is is sediment. It's just material that settles to the bottom of a liquid. It didn't float on top. It wasn't suspended in the middle. It went right to the bottom. And that's what happens with dirt and rock and all the materials that we see layered in the sediments across the world today. Rock made of sediment, such as clastic rock. This is rock made of fragments of other rock that's transported from its source and it's deposited in water. Rock salt or gypsum, which is formed by precipitation from solution. Uh, we're familiar with that word precipitation. We think of that in the form of rain, but we're talking about this uh, material that's waterborne material falling through the water to the bottom, and that is what is left, the sediments left at the bottom, that will eventually create salt or gypsum. And then we're looking at rock which is made from organisms, such as shells, coral, algae, fecal debris, also precipitating from water, falling through the water down to the bottom. And this creates, of course, limestone. So that's what sedimentary rock is. And how did all of that strata get there? When we look at the pictures of these uh, stratified rocks all over the face of the earth. When we read Genesis chapter 7, we read a report that the fountains of the great deep were opened. We also read that the floodgates of the sky were opened. So we've got the fountains of the deep breaking up and opening up and water or lava or some liquid flowing from those fountains upward. And then we've got the floodgates of the sky where water comes from the sky in the form of rain. And by the way, up to those, that day in Genesis chapter 7, there had not been any rain falling. The mist came up from the ground is what we're told in Genesis chapter 2. So we've got rain falling in Genesis 7, which was a new phenomenon in that day. We've got the floodgates opening underneath the earth. And we've got rain falling for 40 days and 40 nights. A lot of rain. It says the water prevailed 15 cubits above the highest mountain. And a cubit is about 18 inches is what we're considering. So we're looking at about 21 feet. 
Waters prevailed for 150 days before they began to recede. That's a long time, 150 days. Tops of the mountains were visible after 10 months. And this is a picture, as we mentioned the fountains of the deep, of a line of volcanoes in the Atlantic Ocean. Everything you see that is red is either a volcano or a, a grouping of volcanoes all down through the Atlantic Ocean from the far north to the far south. There are thousands of these undersea volcanoes in the Atlantic. But we're not just looking at the Atlantic. This is a depiction of the volcanoes of the Pacific. And this, they are so prolific here that this is called the Ring of Fire. Imagine all of those volcanoes erupting at once. What would it be like to have all of that lava coming to the surface of the water? How much condensation would there be? How would that change the atmosphere if all of those were to erupt at once, as we're told they did in the account of Genesis? There's coal in them thar hills. Yes, I wrote that myself. How about that? Coal is a sediment as well. And this is a map of my home state. The blue tinted counties are where you'll find the maximum amount of coal. And they've been mining coal there for a long time and there's still a lot underground. And coal being a sediment, it is there because something in the water, some material in the water sank to the bottom and became coal. And coal is of course, the remnants of organic material. That's what coal is and it's all over the world. Why do we have this standard peat bog theory for coal? It fails in explaining the existence of coal. Peat bogs are full of the roots of plants, but coal is almost entirely made of tree bark. Peat bogs are relatively small in size, but many coal seams go on for miles. Both the top and bottom of peat bogs are irregular, but coal seams have perfectly flat bottoms and tops. So we've got some great distinctions, great differences between peat bogs and coal seams. Peat bogs do not contain marine fossils, of course. You don't see too many sharks swimming around in a peat bog, but coal beds do contain many marine fossils. So there's got to be a different explanation for the existence of coal other than peat bogs. And yet peat bogs remain the consistent, persistent explanation for the existence of coal. Why is that? That doesn't sound very scientific at all. Bituminous ubiquity. There is a picture of a coal seam. That is coal embedded in the rock. It's not really embedded. It's just that the rock formed, or it formed as rock and rock formed on top of it based on the sediments that settled. Coal is formed from organic sediment and it is everywhere on the planet. It takes about 10 to 20 feet of organic material to make a layer of coal one foot thick. So think about that. You find a layer of coal one foot thick, that represents 10 to 20 feet of organic material. Organic material, we're talking about trees, plants, whatever it might be, something that was once alive that has been compressed into coal. Powder River, the Powder River coal seam in Wyoming is 200 feet thick. My goodness, how much organic material was buried to make the Powder River coal seam. That's a lot of organic material. So we're back to this idea of peat bogs. You don't find any peat bogs that are anywhere near that size. But the Powder River coal seam is 200 feet thick. And that coal seam extends for 75 miles. That's a long way for a peat bog to go. We just don't know of any peat bogs anywhere near that size today. But this Coal seam extends 75 miles, and in places it's 200 feet thick. So what in the world caused that sedimentary stuff to go to the bottom, and how did it create so much of it? And we've got a mine in Russia that's 3,000 feet deep. How did all of this material get so deep? And it's enough of it, so it's, it's worth going down there to mine it. So there's, there's plenty of it. Plenty of this uh, coal that formed from sedimentary material. How in the world did it get stacked so thick and how did it get buried so deep? Questions 
that should be on our minds. We can make coal. Well, I can't make coal. I, I wasn't there. But researchers have made coal in less than four weeks. And you can make coal only if there is a catalyst. In other words, plant material, pressure, and heat aren't enough. You have to have a catalyst. Guess what? Volcanic ash provides the perfect chemical elements for such a catalyst. And here is a picture from Ecuador of volcanic ash layers. These are sediments of volcanic ash. So there is evidence that sometime in the past, there was plenty of volcanic ash to serve as a catalyst for the making of coal. What staircase extends for 150 miles and is two miles deep? That's a pretty big staircase. Uh, even if you've got a three or four level house, you probably don't have a staircase that size. But here's a picture of the grand staircase in the United States of America in Arizona and Utah. It is two miles worth of waterborne sediment, two miles deep of waterborne sediment. How much water does it take to create sediment that is two miles deep? And you can see by this diagram some of the depth and the scope of this staircase. Here's another picture of it from a distance. Very beautiful to look at. It's a wonder to behold. I want to ask you a question about this picture. You look across in the picture and you see the layers of sediment that are on that cliff face. But what about all of the layers of sediment that should be between whoever's taking that picture and that cliff face? Where did all of that sediment go? It indicates by looking at the, the cliff face that the sediment would have extended towards the, the photographer, but it's all gone. Where in the world is that sediment? Something had to move that sediment out of the way, and the only thing that could have been, in my mind, would have been the receding waters of the flood. Here is an aerial view of the Grand Canyon. And I don't know what that looks like to you, but that sure looks like a lot of erosion. Here's another view of a Grand Canyon. Looks much the same, doesn't it? I mean, when you look at the Grand Canyon, you've got uh, all of those little tributaries it looks like coming off to the main body of erosion. And then you've got this, very similar in its physical appearance. Here's another picture of that same canyon, and you can see all that is is just some farmer's field where there's been some rain and things have eroded, and yet it does look very much like the Grand Canyon. You've got uh, rocks and you've got debris out in the water and where there would have been debris with erosion, if, if the water washes the debris along, that debris helps create more erosion. And so you can see how great gashes uh, through the earth would have been made by erosion in the past. And there certainly would have been a lot of uh, heavy duty erosion when the waters of the flood receded. This is a picture of Mount St. Helens as it exists today with the canyon in the foreground. This canyon has the north fork of the Toodle River down in the bottom of it. On May 18, 1980, 600 feet of volcanic deposition filled that riverbed. That's 600 feet, 600 feet deep of volcanic ash, rock, things coming from that volcano filled it up. On March 19, 1982, almost two years later, a 90 mile per hour mud flow carved out the canyon in hours, literally in hours. It didn't take days, it didn't take weeks, it didn't take months or years or millions of years. That canyon was carved out in hours and that canyon is about 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. So. What does this canyon show us? It shows us that rapid sedimentation now argues for rapid sedimentation in the past. When we see it happening quickly now, it shows us that it could have happened quickly in the past rather than over millions or billions of years. Rapid erosion now also argues for rapid erosion in the past. If things erode quickly now, as this canyon did, why couldn't they have eroded quickly in the past? I know as well as you, if you've gone to the Grand Canyon and you've stood there with the ranger, the ranger points you down to the Colorado River and says, that little river down there carved out this canyon over millions of years. 
but I have to wonder about that because I see, I see this happening. And I wonder, is that how the Grand Canyon was carved out? Rather, by a huge runoff of water instead of that little old Colorado River flowing down there in the bottom. Here are pictures of some poly straight fossilized trees. I had to look it up how to pronounce poly straight. I think I remembered how to pronounce it, but you can look it up yourself to see how you want to pronounce it. But all this means is poly is many and strat straight, of course, are the strata. We're, we're looking at tree trunks, fossilized tree trunks, that are going through several layers of strata. Now I want you to think about this because if, if it is as we have been told, as I have been told almost all of my life, that each one of those layers of strata was laid down over thousands and millions of years, then how in the world did that organic tree trunk survive long enough to be fossilized through several multiple layers of strata? It seems to me that that tree trunk would have corroded, eroded, decomposed long before any other layers of strata would have engulfed it. And yet we see these poly straight tree trunks going through several, several layers of strata all over the world. Another evidence that these layers were put down quickly rather than over long ages of time. Here's another picture of a poly straight tree trunk. Very impressive. So the question is, how can trees live long enough to be buried by millions of years worth of sedimentary strata? It just wouldn't happen. They can't. They can't live that long. They can't exist that long even if they're dead. The strata had to be formed quickly. So what do these stones mean to you? What are they crying out to you? When Joshua and the Israelites crossed the uh, Jordan River coming into the Promised Land, they were told to go into the river, send one man from each tribe to pick up a stone and set those stones on the opposite side from which they entered so that in time to come, their children would see those stones and ask, what are these stones here for? And their fathers, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers would be able to relate to them how God brought them through the Jordan River, caused it to, to back up and the water flow to stop so that they might come across on dry land. And those stones would be there as a memorial, as a testimony that God brought Israel into the promised land. And I'm telling you today that the stones we see all around us, the rock layers, the strata, these are all testifying to the fact that God did in fact bring a great flood in Noah's day. And as those flood waters retreated, re, uh, receded, they carved out what we now know to be the great canyons and the, uh, the, the, the scenic beauty that we see around us everywhere. This is the lesson for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's helped you see that this world is crying out to us that the things of the scriptures really are the truth.